Well, America voted, and now we are sitting around waiting for the Electoral College to meet and tell us who will be president for the next four years. It looks like it will be Biden right now, but there are some court challenges and recount requests in close states, so who knows? There's still a chance that Trump could win if the courts rule in his favor. But there's a lot of other things to talk about that this election has highlighted, and I think we will. I'm not going to talk about who I think should be president. If you watch my videos regularly, I'm pretty sure that you can figure it out. What I'm going to talk about is some concerns that I have about how this election proceeded. Let's start with one of my favorite groups of problem children, the media. News sources are supposed to present the news in an unbiased manner. Nearly every outlet in the nation showed that they have a strong bias, whether to the right or to the left. There's supposed to be a difference between news and commentary. Commentators give their opinions on the issues of the day. They don't report the news. I expect them to have a bias, and I expect for their bias to show. It's opinion, after all, not reporting. But reporters are supposed to be neutral. That means that every time that a news story has bias, whether from what story is selected to be reported or how it's reported, the reporter and their editor are doing all of us a disservice. That kind of reporting insults the intelligent and fosters a lack of curiosity in the ignorant. Joe Biden was a fatally flawed candidate by any measure. He's been showing signs of senility and poor health throughout the election. There's disturbing rumors of inappropriate behavior and even allegations of sexual assault by him. He's had serious questions raised about his business dealings. He has a past history of seemingly racist behavior and he's actually been caught lying repeatedly and had to drop out of past presidential campaigns because of it. On the other hand, Trump is an aggressive, driven man who's not used to losing, hires his kids to help him run the country, and speaks in a stream-of-consciousness shorthand that leaves his staff scrambling to explain what he actually meant. He's not exactly an ideal candidate either. The press could have pointed out all of their vices and let America decide, but that's not what they did in this election, and that's not what they've been doing for the last five years at least. The media generally doesn't like Trump, and they've hinted at it often enough that Trump calls them out for it. Ever since he first did, the president has been at war with most major media news outlets, and they've stopped pretending to be unbiased in their reporting about him. That polarizes every political discussion. Media outlets need to get back to basics and keep their reporting and commentary firmly separated. 600,000 plus new jobs are good news for the country. Peace deals which normalize relations are good news for the world. Reporting honest numbers on COVID without assigning blame for every failure to just one man and crediting every success to others is a community service which will help people to do what really needs to be done to stop the spread of the disease and keep our economy on track. Awarding Emmys to someone because of their COVID briefings will not. Political polls used to be a decent representative measure of public sentiment. Those days are long gone, though. Political polls are showing some serious problems with bias, and the results they report have been way off because of it. The most egregious example was the ABC Washington Post poll just before the election, which showed Biden up 17 points in Wisconsin, a state which he won by 20,000 votes with all precincts reporting. Even polling aggregators like 538 and Real Clear Politics are off in the final polls. So why is this happening? My theory is that the polls aren't reporting popular sentiment, they're attempting to drive popular sentiment. First of all, many of these polls are sponsored by major news media outlets. ABC News, Washington Post, Fox News, etc. Those outlets are joined by major independent polling organizations like Gallup and Rasmussen, many of whom are based in Washington, D.C., there are also polls run by educational institutes like Marist College and Monmouth University. Now, far be it from me to impugn the honor of those pollsters, but when most polls are consistently off in the same direction, there's a solid indication of bias. It could be sample bias. It could be inherent bias in the methods of contact. It could be bias in question selection. I won't say what it is because, frankly, I don't know. But all of the polls seem to show a consistent bias towards Democratic candidates and issues in their results, and that bias is having detrimental effects. 
Polling aggregates used to work to balance out the bias in polling by averaging results. But when most of the results are off in the same direction, the aggregates will also be off in that direction. Also, polls affect popular opinion because social interactions are largely based on achieving harmony. If a round of polling shows that 70% of the people in the nation are in favor of something, then later rounds of polling on that subject will tend to reflect more people shifting in favor of that thing absent outside influences. Because while individuals value freedom, social groups tend to prefer consensus. Who knows how much effect polling during this election cycle had on voter sentiments? National elections are a tricky thing. Over 155 million people voting all over the country leaves a lot of room for both accidental errors and deliberate fraud. That's why we have election laws, and those election laws include observers and procedures for review, and why voters are required to register everywhere except North Dakota where you have to show a government-issued ID to cast a ballot. That's why state election laws include detailed processes for asking for a recount. What we don't have is national coordination on voter registration to ensure that state voter registration rolls are accurate. We do have laws that require for those rolls to be scrubbed on a routine basis, but it's up to the states to decide when and how. Now, I'm not alleging specific voter fraud, but I will point out that voter registration status often changes without updating the current rolls. People move. They die. They change their names. I think that there should be a national voter registration database, updated daily by the states and by cross-referencing state rolls and the federal rolls, like the Social Security Death Index, in order to catch these status changes. A voter registered in two or more states could have the records flagged for the states to check to see which one is current. Someone who passed away could be flagged so that the state can check on that too. It won't solve every problem with voter registration, but it would provide a powerful tool to cure those roles and help preserve confidence in the process. Polling observers are supposed to be a check on election officials in order to prevent cheating. They aren't supposed to be weaponized. Likewise, election officials should be keen to allow peaceful observation of the polling and tabulation because it ensures the integrity of the process and increases voter confidence. I like that Arizona has webcams set up so that the election workers can be observed by everybody. I dislike that Pennsylvania covered up windows that looked into their tabulation center. More transparency is better, and it saves us all from unending allegations of fraud. The only explanation that occurs to most people when the process becomes opaque is that something suspicious, even illegal, is going on behind the curtains. Let me be clear. Every single precinct that didn't allow observers into the polls or counts should be required to recount every vote under full observation by experts before the results are published. The country needs an accurate count, but we also need fast tabulation so that any questions can be resolved and adequate time is allowed for challenges. Don't worry about the challenges. If everything is above board, then a challenge should not affect the overall results in the slightest. If the concerns which prompted the challenge are proven, then the process should catch the irregularities and allow for them to be addressed. The delay only increases the level of frustration and decreases confidence in the process and the results. No matter who winds up being elected, though, the next presidential term will lack a fundamental intangible, a mandate. Oh sure, a mandate will be claimed, but any time that an election is this close, that mandate is questionable. It doesn't matter what folks like Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell say about it either. If Trump wins, it will be due to his successful challenges in several states proving that fraud occurred. And if Biden wins, well, he squeaked by in several key states. This election is going to be decided on razor-thin margins, and in either case, the president won't have enough coattails to hand him a strong majority in Congress. President Biden will have lost ground in the House and likely not flip the Senate. President Trump will still have to work with Speaker Nancy Pelosi. That will mean a whole lot of nothing happening in Washington, other than the usual accusations, backroom deals, and careful diversion of public funds to projects which the voters would not normally support. The Senate looks to be decided by a single seat and could very well require the vice president to break a lot of tie votes. The House majority has narrowed considerably, leaving us with a requirement for strict party discipline in every vote just to get something passed. If Biden does win, as the current standings suggest, then he will probably lack the energy to get anything in his agenda done, if he even has one. 
If Trump wins after successfully challenging the results of the election in the courts, then we can expect at least two years of him publicly ridiculing Congress for doing nothing. Either way, it's likely going to be 2022 before we can break through the thin majorities in Congress and stand a chance to get anything done, whether it's a liberal progressive issue or a conservative populist proposal. And then we get to do this all again. With the president claiming that he, or she, should Harris happen to succeed Biden, needs a clear majority in both houses to get anything done. Congress fighting tooth and nail for every seat, the media claiming that certain proposals from a certain party are just dumb, the pollsters desperately trying to figure out how to fix their polls while still keeping their customers happy, and the rest of the world desperately wondering if the United States is going to get its act together. Don't count on either candidate conceding. It doesn't matter if they do or don't, though. There is no legal requirement for a defeated candidate to concede the election in order to validate the election results. Whomever wins the Electoral College vote can be inaugurated without their opponent conceding in the least. At the same time, the official results of the election will be known when the joint section of Congress hears the results of the Electoral College vote and performs their duty to accept or reject each state's certificate of vote. There's a process for this listed in the Electoral Count Act of 1887, Public Law 49-90, and a state's certificate of vote has been rejected before. The last time it happened was in 1872 for a single certificate and 1876 when deciding between multiple certificates. This is a part of the excruciating process of resolving the dilemma when Congress fails to certify that a candidate has polled a majority in the Electoral College, in which case Speaker Pelosi would lead the House in selecting a president and Vice President Pence, acting in his capacity as President of the Senate, would lead the Senate in selecting a vice president. If that happens, both will be worth watching, especially the Senate vote, where both vice presidential candidates are in the chamber. Kamala Harris would be voting on whether she should be vice president, and Mike Pence would be charged with breaking any ties. And if Congress still can't get the election decided by Inauguration Day, well, then the Speaker of the House will be sworn in as acting president until they do. In any case, I'm betting that we will have plenty to talk about in the years to come, if we can still stomach discussing politics, economics, social issues, and related subjects. If the platforms that we use for these discussions still permit them, of course. If not, well, maybe I'll start a new channel about cooking or something.